Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Kent with Bent number 134 in the Pale Kent Light, which, uh, yeah, no, the images in this is not from In the Pale Moonlight, which, of course, is by many accounts, including mine, the best single episode of Star Trek ever. Although that does not necessarily mean that Star Trek Deep Space Nine is my favorite series ever. I do think it contains the best episode ever. And I know that Bent disagrees with me. Yeah, that's all right. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but well, you like Spock's brain, so, you know. <laughs> I do like Spock's brain, and I'm proud of it. It's so weird. If you say so. It's so, it's, I mean, it's objectively weird in the sense that it's very unusual for someone to have that as, like, on their list of good episodes, and not their list of the worst I didn't ever. say it's good, I said I like it. Okay, fair enough. I guess that is, <laughs> that is true. Uh, <laughs> yes, as Morgan Poirier points out, even the Jem'Hadar fear the mighty dapper dinosaur. Um, is that way even seven? He was a true patriot. I actually don't know which way unit it is. Um, I'm just, I'm doing it because I'm doing a thing where basically I'm just replacing, uh, Jeffrey Combs in Star Trek okay. with Kent Hovind. So I'm probably going to do Brunt and that other like single episode character. He did in deep space nine. Uh, I already did Shran. I'm probably going to replace the red and or blue light on Agamus with Kent's face. In case you've seen the uh, Agamus episodes of Star Trek Lower Decks. Did you know that? I don't think I have. Yeah. You didn't even know Jeffrey Combs was in Lower Decks, did you? I don't think so. Yeah. He plays an evil supercomputer. Yeah. I'm yeah. missing out. Yeah, you yeah. are. Maybe after we finish uh, Power Rangers, then the, all the Godzilla oh, movies, we can move on to Star Trek. That's a good idea. Watch all of Star Trek. That won't take forever. <laughs> Watch 55 years or something worth of content. I love it. Uh, all right. Well, we're not here to talk about Agamus or Jeffrey Combs or Star Trek. Unfortunately, those would all be uh, at least less brain damage inducing. Instead, we're here to talk about Kent Hovind, one of the <sighs> stupidest people alive. And by that, I mean someone who goes out of his way to be wrong about everything. I don't no. mean that he's necessarily unintelligent, although I suspect that he is. I mean that he is always doing like own goals all the time. Uh, we got a couple uh, things to read here real quick. We've got from um, Sam, AIG is a bag of peace. <laughs> Talbert, I'm not going to drink just because I read your name, Sam Talbert. That's cheating. But I'm going to drink because you sent a Mothra and a Godzilla. So there you go. Um, and then Vandalia1998 for $10 says, Deep Space Nine is the only Star Trek series I watched from beginning to end via the original air date. Uh, the others were before my time, and I started in the middle or ended in the middle of watched years later. Yeah, I mean, look, Deep Space Nine is great. I'm a big fan of Deep Space Nine. I, I'm just a bigger fan of, of uh, probably TNG. Um, I also really like, look, I like most of the shows, right? <clears throat> I like Enterprise, I like TNG, I like Deep Space Nine, I like Voyager, I like Lower Decks, I like Strange New Worlds. Uh, I liked the third season of Picard. I haven't, I think I've seen two episodes of Discovery that I didn't think were absolutely horrible. Um, which I know is more than I think Bent has. <laughs> yeah, I think um, so. And interestingly enough, they were the ones that were the most tonally different from wow. Discovery. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I, I gave up on Discovery um, after trying to get through season two and I just couldn't. I gave up on Card about three quarters of the way through season one and I just couldn't. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, Silent Tetrapod member for 13 months says, DS9 has the best character ever, Garrick. Garrick is great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. But we're here to talk about Kent Hovind. Although, I guess, if you guys want <laughs> to turn this into a Star Trek chat, just keep Milestone and Super Chatting about Star Trek. And I just won't talk yeah. about Kent Hovind. You can, you can prevent me from doing Kent Hovind and turn this into Star Trek, if that's what you want. But that will be expensive. So, uh, <clears throat> we have a drinking game when we do this. And the first thing I want to say is that, uh, okay, from now on, I'm not going to answer Star Trek questions that aren't super chatted because I know you guys. You will try to get to me. I see you <laughs> DM Wing and his deplorable ilk asking me about Harry Mud. Not going to answer that. It's, you're trying to distract me. I see it. 
All right. Um, yeah, we're here to talk about Ken Hoven. We have a drinking game. The first thing I want to say about that is if you decide to play along, you, first of all, do not have to play along with alcohol. If you want to play along with a vape pen, with water, with tea, with coffee, with juice, with soda, all that's great. The other thing is sometimes this drink counter can get pretty high. So if your idea of take a drink is like take a shot, don't do that. Don't do that. That's mm -hmm. like sips. Yeah, this is like a sip of beer every drink, right? Um, this is not a take a shot. We'll die. Don't do that. Um, <clears throat> and if you do decide to play with any kind of intoxicating substance, please know your limits. Pace yourself. Be responsible. Don't go out, play this game, and then operate heavy machinery. Drive a car. Drive a train. Text your ex. None of these things are good ideas. This show accepts neither liability nor responsibility for what you do after playing along. Because I've warned you. You are on notice. Don't do any of those things. Be responsible. That being said, uh, let's go over the drinking rules real quick. We've already seen at least one of them, which is that if you super chat uh, any of the kaiju emojis or some membership milestone chat, and you do have to be a, a channel member for this, uh, it's, that includes Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, we will take a drink for that. Uh, if you want to join the channel, there's a little join button right down there. It starts out at $1.99, and you can get access to all the cool channel emojis. Uh, let's see. If you... If Kent Hovind says something that's so stupid, we just kind of have to drink in order to, you know, cool our brains a little bit. We'll take a drink for that. If Kent Hovind says something that's factually accurate and isn't just, uh, you know, him reading from someone else's work. It's actually something he knows and he articulates it himself. We'll take a drink for that. If Kent Hovind tells a joke that doesn't land or a story that didn't happen, we'll take a drink. Now, the story that didn't happen is going to be a bit of a judgment call. But if it sounds like something that should be on r slash that happened, we're probably going to take a drink for it. We'll also take a drink if uh, Kent Hovind references that German political party from like the 1930s and 40s that you'd rather not see. Yeah, that group. Take a drink for that. He does that a lot, actually. I will also take a drink if Kent Hovind confuses the find of Lucy for what we know about any larger taxon to which she belongs. So, for instance, if he says, oh, we don't know what Australopithecus afarensis' hands were like or what Lucy's hands were like because she wasn't found with hands. Well, one, it's true, she wasn't. But two, we have other Australopithecus afarensis hands, so that's that hominid. We can only get one of those per uh, stream because once they happen once, it just keeps on happening, and it usually overlaps with the stupid part, so we don't worry about it too much. There's also Trojan Source. If Ken Hovind cites a source, which he does occasionally, and we can check on it, we do, and not only does the source not support his contention, but it actively contradicts him, that is a Trojan source. We take a drink for that. Now, that's not a huge thing for Kent, mostly because he doesn't cite that many sources, uh, although it was very prevalent for Randy Galooza when he was on uh, Dapper Reacts. There's also a prediction. If Bent or I can predict where Kent is going to go next, where it's not very clear, and we are right, take a drink for a prediction. There's also a few other ways you guys can make drinks happen. Uh, so if you decide to uh, send a super chat and it says anything to the effect that AIG are a bag of dicks. That's Answers in Genesis. We will take a drink for that. Now, you do have to be a little clever. You can't just type it in plain text that Answers in Genesis is a bag of dicks. Apparently, YouTube doesn't like the phrase bag of dicks for some reason. I don't know. Um, everything okay over there? I think so. The dog jumped down or anything? Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Savage. The dog jumped down. Savage Sarcopterigi is extinct, Cobra. Jeez. Uh, it says AIG is a transporter buffer of things that may be accessed via Horcon. <laughs> I see. So wait, are you saying that AIG is uh, was desirous of Jamaharon? And I'll take a drink. Is do you think AIG is seeking Jamaharon? Who me? Yeah. Do you, do you think that that's what they're doing? Sure. You don't even Why? know what Jamaharon is. Nope. It's okay, because it's never been explicitly described in the show. But it's very clearly sexy. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Alright, so, uh, let's see. Uh, we'll all stick a drink for each gifted membership. So if you go down to the support the channel button, there's an option to gift memberships. It is $5 each. You can give one, five, I think it goes to 10, 25, 50, I think? I'm not sure. I actually haven't done it in a while. But, um, yeah, that's another option. We'll take one drink for each of those up to a certain point. Then I'll just finish this drink and go get another one and add the appropriate number to the drink counter. And um, <clears throat> tell you what, just for today, I will take a drink every time you distract me with a super chat about Star Trek. 
<laughs> just for today. Because that actually does kind of sound fun. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, here we go. Kent Hovind. This is a CSE 103, Class 1. The topic is allegedly explanations, explanation about the lines in the textbooks. Now, I tell you it's allegedly the topic, because remember that time that the topic was like insects or something, and we spent like mm -hmm. no time talking about insects? Yeah. Yeah, Kent's, Kent's stuff is like that. It's like, this is what I'm talking about. And then he just goes on and on mm -hmm. about nothing. So, here we go. Well, thank you for joining us. This will be Creation Science Evangelism, Class 103. CSE 103. If you missed the first two... Now, I want to remind everyone, these CSE classes that he's giving are not only his deep dive into all of his crazy beliefs, but allegedly they were given and accepted for college credit in at least a few, one or two places. And now I'm suspecting that these are um, not very well credentialed schools, shall we say. Uh, 101 and 102, you can get those on videotape. What we're doing is we're covering what's on my uh, seminar on creation at a much slower pace, covering all the details, taking time for any questions. And if you have any questions, if you're in the class here, of course, if you're on video, you, you can write us in or call us with questions. But here in the class, if you have any questions, raise your hand and say, wait a minute, what does this mean? Or let's talk about that some more. Do you think he still accepts questions about his CSE classes? Probably like, not. Okay. Because I was going to say, like, if I sent uh, <laughs> Kent, like, a letter... Like, hey, Kent, in CSE 103, Class 2, <laughs> at the 45-minute mark, you say this. I don't understand. He might respond. He might. Uh, he, he might. I think I suspect that he would respond with, like, I'm not sure what that is, and I don't have that to hand. Could you, could you explain what exactly I said and what your question is? Um, yeah. We left off in our last class uh, talking about the lies in the textbooks. Things that kids have to face every day in school, they faced them today. Things that have been proven wrong many years ago. Some people... Remember, his list of these things are uh, either things that aren't taught in classrooms or things that actually aren't wrong. But I'm sure yeah. we'll get into it deeper. ...would like kids to believe in evolution. They want them to believe that we all came from a rock. For oh, we forgot to go over something. Ben, what are you wearing? I'm wearing this pink tutu. It's lovely. Why are you wearing a pink tutu? It's a donation incentive, and we met it the last Kent with Ben. We did. That's true. So, could everyone get you to do it again? Maybe like next yeah, week. Yeah. If we meet, if we meet the uh, incentive donation again. Okay. I'll wear it again next week. All right. Sad. I forget what the amount is. I know what the amount is. <laughs> uh, Silent Tetrapod for five dollars says AIG is a jumbo bag of Admiral Marcus's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take a drink for that. Yeah. I always thought that the whole Carol Marcus thing in the prime timeline was something that happened a lot later in Kirk's life. But then I realized, like, I guess his son was pretty old at that point, so I guess it must have been from a while ago. I don't know. Um, yeah. Anyway, Zemmour42 for $3 says, AIG is an id fortress of Rick Sanchez. <laughs> okay, I'll take a drink for that. Yeah. Um... I do wish they'd done a little bit more with the Kelvin timeline. Maybe, like, put a show there. Um, especially since I'm really tired of them pretending that shows that are now, at this point, explicitly not in the prime timeline. Or they're just pretending that they are. And then, like, dude, it's okay. Like, Strange New Worlds is explicitly in a new timeline. There was a time travel episode in which some Romulan agent is like, I have changed the timeline. I pushed the eugenics wars from the 90s into the early 2000s or 2020s or something. Like, yeah, okay, so you're explicitly in a different timeline. Just accept it and go with it. It's fine. Anyway. 1.6 billion years ago, and they have to give them some evidence. One of the evidences presented in just about every textbook is this one right here. This textbook says, we have evidence of evolution from micro or molecular biology. I mean, yeah, the, you know, this hierarchy in genetics is uh, pretty compelling, especially since genes are literally the thing that you get from your ancestors, right? <clears throat> like, if it is the thing that is most directly related to ancestry. So if you're going to see evidence for common ancestry anywhere, it would be in the genes. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, molecular, of course, means at the molecule level. Very, very, very tiny. I, you know what? Technically true, Kent. I don't know why you needed to say it, but yes. Taking a drink for it. And biology is... Oh, wait, what are you drinking? 
I'm drinking some green tea. Nice. I am drinking some cola with vodka in it. Yum. Is, eh, it just tastes like cola, except it's, you know, getting me a little... Gets you a little buzzed. Little buzzed. Nice. It's the study of life. Bio means life. Ology means the study of. I mean, it really comes from the word lo- logos, which means word, but whatever. It's fine. It's reasonable a reasonable description of how it's used in English. So, they're saying the study of extremely small branches of life, the molecules, gives evidence for evolution. Calling molecules a branch of life is... I think he's just misspeaking, but, like, no. There are no branches of life that are themselves molecules. All of the living things that we know of, and even of the simplest living things we can reasonably conceive of, are assemblages made up of many molecules. There are no living molecules. Prions might be, like, kind of close, but I've never met anyone who would argue that prions are in and of themselves alive. Me neither. Well, now, does it really? Let's just talk about that. Um, A molecule is very tiny. A good illustration to understand how small a molecule is, the best one I know of, is a grain of salt. You know how small a grain of salt is, right? One cube... I mean... They vary, but it's, it sure is small, I guess. A cube of salt is very tiny. If you took a grain of salt and expanded it so that it was as tall as the Sears Tower, 1,200 feet tall, I believe the Sears Tower is. <laughs> Isn't that the Willis Tower now? Yes. Okay. But I don't think that was the case when this was made. It used to be. I'm pretty sure this still is. Okay. But I'm pretty sure it was still the Sears Tower when this was made. And also, don't people still often refer to it as the Sears Tower? Because it's a better name than the Willis Tower. A lot of people do. Yeah, okay. And 1,200 feet wide and 1,200 feet deep. Average Sarcopter Ridgey is extinct, Cobra. For $5 says, AIG is a bag of Riker's primary diplomatic implements. Uh, it gives cowboy diplomacy a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Take a drink. Mm. Maybe he's going to do some reverse cowboy diplomacy. Maybe. If you expanded it to that size, the molecules would expand at the same ratio. Hmm. The molecules of sodium chloride. That doesn't strike me as being quite right. I feel like that's an ion. Yeah, it's an ionic ionic bond. bond. It is. There are literally no molecules in this compound. So... I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take a drink for for Kent not knowing the difference between ionic bonds and covalent bonds, and I'm sure he's never heard of metallic bonds. So, he's only taught science for 15 years. How would he know this stuff? Jeez. Uh, Riker prefers cowgirl uh, diplomacy. Says Savage Sarcopterigi is extinct. Cobra. Okay, but what about that one episode when he was with the androgynous person? You know, that could have gone either way. Uh, which. I still maintain is about gay rights. Mostly because that's what the writers and the actors said. You know. Ben Dolly in 1998 for $5 says, if you want to talk about two wrong theories of evolution, let's talk about the two from TNG Genesis and the chick. Okay, first of all, we're taking a drink because I've been asked to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, in case anyone's not aware, there was an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation in which everyone catches a <clears throat> de-evolution virus somehow, because that's a thing that makes sense, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense in the face of it. Oh, thanks, dogs. Um, so the first big problem is that, uh, yeah, you can't just de-evolve. That's not really a thing. You don't have all of the genetic inf- like code that your ancestors had. There are actual mutations that pr- would prevent that. You can't just reverse all the, tr- the uh, mutations. How would the virus know which mutation or which genes to change to revert to an ancestral state? There's no way. Uh, second, while some of the transformations made sense, like um, Riker turned into like uh, a Neanderthal ape-ish thing, and I think uh, Picard turned into like some kind of scared shrew thing, didn't he? Something like that. Um, and then when it comes to the alien characters or the partly alien characters like Deanna Troy or Worf, who knows what Klingons and Betazoids evolved from, so whatever, fine. Troy turns into a frog, that's fine. Um, but there's a few other ones like, um, let's see, Spot turns into an iguana? And iguanas are not in the evolutionary tree of cats anywhere, not even close. Um, or Barkley turns into a spider? 
That's even worse than Spot turning into an iguana. Not okay, guys. That's, like, learn some basic biology. Also reminds me how bad the biology of the Okampa is, where every Okampa female gives birth to at most one child in her entire life and requires a male partner to do it. Like, okay, so every single generation, at best, your population is being cut in half. That's assuming that every female reproduces. And that's not going to happen. There are going to be some who die young. There's going to be some who have some kind of fertility problem. Mm -mm. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, Goop23 and his deplorable ilk for $2 says, AIG is a bag of things that expand. We'll take a drink for that. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. They would become large enough that they would become the size of the original grain of salt. I wonder how we calculate this, given that there's no such thing as a molecule of salt. Yeah, I don't know. How many grains of salt would it take to stack up to be equal to the top of the Sears Tower? I don't know, because there's no single grain size for salt, Kent. Salt, this is a cuboid crystal, and it can come in lots of sizes. It... <clears throat> Do you mean like the salt from like your Morton's salt container that you put into your salt shaker? Table it's, salt? Yeah. I mean, you no. Know, do you mean like the flakes and kosher salt? Do you mean like the big hunkin' bits that you get in the pink Himalayan salt that you can put in your salt grinder? I, I don't know. Several, right? That's how many molecules are stacked up the side of a cube of salt. And remember, how many molecules are there in pure sodium chloride? <laughs> exactly zero. None. Yep. Not even a one. So molecules are extremely tiny. And they're telling the kids, see, we've got evidence from molecular biology. Well, in the early 50s, Jan, did you find anything about DNA in those old textbooks? Not even mentioned. 1911 biology textbook doesn't mention DNA at all, does it? How about Yeah, we hadn't figured out that DNA was the molecule of inheritance. I don't, I don't know what, if he, I'm not sure if he's saying that that's a problem or what. I don't know what he's getting at. The 1925 textbook, no mention at all. What do you find in yours, Steve? About molecular biology. Um, or DNA. DNA, I guess that uh, three natural processes underlying evolution. They emphasize evolution in every case, right? Did you yeah, evolution was pretty well established by, the, by 1911. Uh, there were still a lot of weird misconceptions that were prevalent, like orthogenesis or uh, macromutationism, and there was still, <coughs> it was still thought there might be a, uh, con like a, uh, a conflict between the so-called Darwinians and the so-called mutationists. But yeah, I mean, common descent and descent with modification were essentially universally accepted in science by that time. You find it in yours, uh, about DNA? Yeah, they... In all the new textbooks, those are 98 edition textbooks. I've got some 2001s uh, in the office. I couldn't find them in, the, in, uh, in a hurry there. But all the new textbooks say DNA offers evidence for evolution. Well, now, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It is a molecule. The DNA molecule is the most complicated molecule in the universe. I would want a citation hmm. for that one. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But... I first I want to know how you're measuring complexity, and second I want to know how you've surveyed every single type of molecule that exists to verify that this one is the most complex version. I mean, you might be able to argue that given my definition of uh, complexity that I just came up with that I think is real, this is the most complex known molecule that might work, but just <laughs> declaring it to be the most complex molecule in the universe, I don't think you possibly have that information. And yeah, as Ancestral Clydesdale Megafauna says, cit uh, citation needed. That is, that is known today. This textbook says, um, the greater the percentage of DNA sequence, the, greater they have in, uh, the more they have in common. In other words, they're comparing the sequences and saying, this proves some kind of similarity. This um, hey, Bent. Yeah. Let's suppose that someone tried to sue you for child support. <laughs> But you're pretty darn sure that that kid isn't yours. Okay. It's like maybe Billie Jean tries to get your, you on child support. She thinks that you are the one. But you're like, no. The boy is not my Billie son. Billie Jean is not my lover. No. And the boy is not your son. How would you... 
go about demonstrating that? I think a DNA test could do it. Okay, and if like, there's insufficient similarity, then it would demonstrate pretty conclusively that the boy is not your son? Correct. But what if there were a high degree of similarity? What if he shared, like, 50% of your variation in highly variable regions the, of the genome? Is that enough to be a match? Yeah, it's more than enough. Hmm. Well, there you go. It's like, it looks like the boy is your son, and Billie Jean might not be your lover, but she probably was at one point. Hmm. It's almost like, yeah, uh, DNA definitely, definitively, absolutely indicates descent. Because that's how it gets to be where it is. It's through common descent. People weren't expecting an MJ reference. Well, you never know what you're going to get here on Dapper Dino. Textbook says, Darwin speculated that all forms of life, all forms of life are related through descent with modification from earliest organisms. Earlier, the earliest organisms. This speculation has been verified as we have learned more about molecular biology. Yeah, so what Kent is talking about is, hey, <clears throat> when evolution was first theorized and we gained our first evidence of it, we didn't have a clear idea as exact to exactly how hered heredity works. But <clears throat> the theory predicted that when we found out how heredity should work, that the whatever mechanism of inheritance is, it should follow in line with the nested hierarchy that we would predict from evolution. And then it did. And now Kent is going to tell you why confirming this prediction is actually not evidence, in fact. Look what they're teaching the kids in this book. They're saying, Darwin guessed that everything was related. Now we know it's true. Ah, I mean, he did a little bit more than guess, but sure, fair enough. And of course, Vandali1990 for $2 says, might not be Ben's kid, but he'd be probably very close. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe it's, it's actually like your nephew. Your nephew. Maybe. Seems very unlikely. That's the propaganda yeah, the kids have to face. Now we know it's true. Now just hold on a minute. If there are similar DNA sequences, and we'll get into that in a minute, would that prove we're related? Uh, yes. In the colloquial sense, not in the mathematical sense of like 100% irrefutable proof, like a mathematical theorem, but <clears throat> in the in the colloquial sense, yeah. Like for instance, um, what if that, what if instead of uh, testing to see if someone is uh, your kid, you take a test and you find out that you have a gen an identical genetic code, and they seem to have be the same age as you, that's pretty much proof positive that you're twins, right? We can go out from there, right? different amounts of genetic similarity. So you're going to probably be about as genetically similar to your parents as you are to your full siblings. You're probably going to be about as um, genetically similar to any of your first cousins as you are to any of the other first cousins. Uh, you're probably going to be about as similar to your parents as you are to your kids, and then it goes out from there, right? And so, well, as similar to any one of your parents as you are to your any one of your kids. I should clarify there, right? And this is because of descent. That's where differences in DNA come from and where similarities come from. So the question that creationists need to be able to answer in order to actually counter this, the confirmed prediction of evolution, I want to point out, is they actually need to find a point at which they can objectively verify where descent stops and how it is that the genetics continue on with the same pattern of increasing difference with differences in morphology and also why it correlates so well to things like paleontology. They don't have anything. They've not even proposed anything. The best they've done is done morphological studies in their silly experimentological matrices, in which they intentionally, is my contention, <laughs> leave out relevant taxa in order to get artificially dis disparate groups. That's the best they've done, which doesn't even address the fundamental question of how do you genetically determine where the kinds lines are. Rosen a Keller, uh, sorry, Rosen a transmissible parasitic dog Keller for 499 says, Kent doesn't think and or denies predictions are a core part of sciencing. Yeah, he, he might actually um, say that predictions are just no big deal. Like, who cares? Or could it prove we have the same designer? Would you agree that the, the Ford and the uh, 
Let's take the Ford uh, Lincoln, the, or say Lincoln Continental, and the uh, other cars built by Ford Motor Company have lots of similarities. Okay, um, I'm going to take a drink. Now, let's say you had a, a Lincoln Continental, and I had a Lincoln Continental. Yeah. How closely related are our cars, genetically, in terms of a family they, line? They don't have any relation at all. No, not even a little bit. They're completely they unrelated. Have genetics. Nope. They're so both is, assembled. Right. So this is a fundamental. At, at best, you can say that the design is kind of analogous, but fundamentally, these things do not have any relationship to each other. No matter how similar they are, they could be identical down to the molecule. You could have just created both cars out of the same transporter buffer on the Enterprise. All right, transporter buffer pattern. Right. <clears throat> They're not related. They don't have any descent. They're made of, com they're, they're completely separate. But we know that's not true for organisms. We know that you and your tw identical twin brother or sister are related. And we know in part because you're identical <clears throat> and because that's how organisms work. We know you're related to your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents. <laughs> Because not only is that how organisms work, organisms come from previous organisms as a general rule, but we also know that you actually are related on the basis of your genetics. Oh, and Borg Emporia says I'm a good content creator. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Probably many of them have a radiator in the front, and a front bumper, and a back bumper, and four tires, and the tires are round, as round as they can make them. Mm -hmm. Does that prove they all evolved from a golf cart? No, because we know for certain that they didn't, because they don't have genetics, so they can't reproduce and they can't mutate. In fact, we know that the Ford Focuses, or sorry, the Lincoln Continentals, I forgot what we were talking, what car we were talking about. We know that even two of those don't share common ancestry. Take another drink, I can't. Or could it prove they have the same designers, the same engineers? Well, in this case, yes, because we know they can't do anything else. You're fundamentally be using a disanalogy, Ken. You cannot, it's not even an analogy. He's trying to use cars as a model, right? He's trying to say, this is how, the model of how design works. And so I'm taking cars as my model item, and we're going to examine how similarity and differences work in cars, and apply that model to living things, except fundamentally, no cars are related. But you don't think that, Kent. You don't think that Eric popped out of his mom because of a special particular instance of intelligent design from God to specifically create Eric Hovind. You think, Kent, I mean, I know that Kent is absurdly bad at how genetics and sexual reproduction works, but he's at least right that Eric has DNA from Kent and mm -hmm. from Joe, right? His first wife. Well, presuming Joe wasn't stepping out, but I'm pretty sure she wasn't based on what I know of her. It was very unlikely. Um, you don't think that, Kent. You think that he shares your DNA and that he shares Joe's DNA and that therefore <clears throat> there is genetic throughput there. But you know that's not true of cars. Bruce in a transmissible parasitic dog color for 499 says, have you tried looking up car sex? It's not a thing. Well, okay, it is a thing. It's just not what happens when two cars have sex. It's, it's what happens when two people have sex in a car. Like in Titanic. Famous cinematic instance of car sex. Right, here we go. So what happens here, we get into a, a logical fallacy. They say, well, look, because we're similar DNA to these organisms, therefore we must be related. I say, no, no, no. We have a common designer. You have not provided even an analogy as to how that could work. I don't see how that's a fallacy either. What's the fallacy? Uh, basically, he's saying because it doesn't correspond to his bad analogy, and therefore it doesn't make any sense. That's not what a fallacy is, though. Correct. <laughs> okay. You are, you are correct Glad about that. Let me clear that, that up. Yep. <laughs> so don't fall into the trap that this proves evolution, or even helps to support evolution. It does not. Yes, the confirmed prediction, which can only reasonably be explained by evolution, is not, in fact, evidence for evolution as a result of Kent fundamentally not knowing the difference between cars 
and living things. Yep. Wah, wah. I'm just taking a drink. That is yeah, whew. pretty bad. This is a lie that's in the textbooks that kids have to face every day. And they'll say, well, we've got proof of evolution from DNA. Here's, this is a picture of a DNA molecule. If you took a ladder... Is he going to show the picture? Maybe. Okay. If we had a long extension ladder, a real long extension ladder that went about from here to Chicago. He's probably in Pensacola, Florida, for those of you who need a point of reference, which is um, over near like the Florida Panhandle, if you know your U.S. state geography reasonably well. If you're not from the U.S. and none of that makes means anything to you, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. I guess maybe check Google Maps. That might help. I don't know. But it's a considerable difference. It's probably like what? Like 2,500 miles or something? 2,000 something miles? Like that. Yeah, something like that. And we had one end, somebody holding that end still in Chicago, and here I am in Florida, and I start twisting my end of the ladder. And twist it around and around. I guess it's a rope ladder. Around and around. So like twisting up a, a watch band, okay? Oh, there's the picture. The individual... Also, there's way too many molecules if these circles are each supposed to be molecules. Yeah. Yeah, there's not nearly that many in each little bit of DNA. Uh, Roasting a transmissible parasitic dog, Keller says, Florabama. Florabama? Yeah, basically Florabama, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, he moved from Florida to Alabama to start up his new dinosaur adventure land. That's because he just barely hopped over the border, right? He's not, like, his current um, residence is right next door to Pensacola. The rungs of the ladder are called the genes. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Benz, what, what is a rung on the DNA ladder? It's not a gene, I'll tell oh. you that. It is a nucleotide base pair. Take a drink for that. G-E-N-E. -E. So when they talk about genetic similarity, that's what they're talking about. These genes are similar. Well, I mean, they are talking about differences on the quote-unquote rungs, but each rung is not itself a gene. A gene is made up of new multiple codons, or should be coda, but whatever. Everyone goes with codons, so I'm going to go with codons too. But each codon is itself a grouping of three of the nucleotides. And I would say base pairs, but it really only matters what's on one side of it for each particular codon. But uh, yeah, so far we're getting everything wrong. In fact, this might actually yeah. be where that famous clip of him getting everything wrong about genetics is from. It might be. So if we have this ladder that goes from Florida to Chicago, and we have twisted it up in a long spiral, the two sides of the ladder yep. stay the same distance apart. I think it is. But it kind of curves as it goes around, and the rungs of the ladder, the round part, will hold it that distance apart, but now it's like a spiral staircase. Uh, I mean, no, it's not like a spiral staircase. It's... Look, you couldn't climb it like a spiral staircase. So a spiral staircase, the actual staircase itself, if you draw a line down the middle of the steps... <clears throat> the stat line itself will trace out a helix, right? The double helix of the DNA only traces out a helix on away from the middle. If you actually trace it down the middle, then if you had straightened out the DNA so it didn't, wasn't you know curled or anything, but you didn't remove the helical pattern, that actually would just be a straight line, right? So it's not the same as a spiral staircase, but it is two different helices, uh, helices that actually been opposite to each other. Right. So they have the same rotational direction, but they're always 180 degrees out of phase. And then the base pair stretches between them, such that the middle would be in line with before and after, rather than itself tracing out a helix. So Kent is... Look, it's not an easy thing to describe mathematically, so I'm not going to give Kent too much slack on it, but it's definitely not correct. Uh, <clears throat> Tiri, I'm Dapper's GM, so you may call me... God, Rana, which, by the way, Thierry, I'm still your GM, too. Says, are Gene Wilder and Gene Hackman similar genes? <laughs> no, in fact, they are quite different genes. Thank you. And then, Harry Bronson for $5 says, in before he mentions the miracle spiral staircase in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I don't think he's going there, but maybe. If we twist it and twist it and twist it, it starts pretty soon to not in on itself, so it's actually double twisted. And okay, look. DNA does curl up on itself, but it's not primarily because it's twisted too much, right? 
it actually tends to twist around proteins called histones. <clears throat> and so histones get in there and they start to fold this up a little. It's, I'm not going to knock them too much because it doesn't really matter that much as far as I can tell for this discussion exactly why there's more than one twist going on in DNA. But we'll just, it's fine. It's just, he's not quite right about that. Um, <clears throat> Savage, Sarcopterygi is extinct Cobra for $10 says, the distance between Pensacola and O'Hare Airport is 690 mi nautical miles. Really? A lot shorter than I was thinking. Are you sure? Additionally, the identifier for Pensacola is PNS, which shares consonants with the contents of the bag labeled AIG. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a drink for that. I was not expecting that, actually. Nice. I was, uh, yeah, no, you <laughs> did not know it was going there. All right. You can tell by the picture here. If you take a DNA molecule and unwind it, it becomes incredibly long. You figure the average human body has uh, 50 trillion cells. Well, does, it, does it say anything about the histones here? Uh, and extend I think the it's DNA. showing them. It is, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is showing them. Like, I think that's what these little, like, if you look in these yeah. little, these things here where it's wound, the histone is like the little ball in the middle over, um, like, to the top right of that biology textbook. So it's showing them, but I don't know if it says anything about them. So, yeah. Okay. Only, the only cell visible to the naked eye is the egg cell. Well, the only human cell visible to the naked eye. There are actually many cells that are visible to the naked eye. Um, <clears throat> there are ner numerous neurons in various animals that are visible to the naked eye. There are some macroscopic organisms that can get to be quite large that are actually single-celled. Uh, slime molds are single cell. They're polynucleated, but they're a single cell. They share a single cell membrane. So I I'm going to give Kent... A little bit of charity and say that he was talking about human cells. He is right. The only single human cell that's normally visible to the human eye is the ovum. And it's even then, I mean, it's very hard to notice. You would have to look very, very hard to see an ovum. But you can. It is technically possible. That a woman produces in order to have a baby. All other cells in the body are too small to see without a, at least a good magnifying glass. And in most cases, a microscope. With a real strong magnifying glass. He's, he's right about that. Unless you've been doing cytology without a microscope and not telling me. No, I definitely used a microscope. Terry, I'm Dapper's GM. You may call me Gonron. I just gave the Dapper Dinosaur membership, and it went to Jillian Miracles from Molecules, Ren. Thank you very much. I'll take a drink for that. Class, you can see cells. You can uh, take, we did experiments in biology class where you take a popsicle stick and you scrape the inside of your cheek, and you can get skin cells off very easily. No, no, you can't. You cannot get skin cells from the inside of your cheek. Because the inside of your cheek isn't skin. skin. Jeez, Kent, come on. I'm taking another drink. Oh my goodness. It's epithelial tissue, Kent. It's not dermal tissue. Jeez. I, why, why does he have to be so consistently wrong about everything? <laughs> I He's don't. good at it. He's got a lot of practice. I guess, but like, dude, it doesn't even like it doesn't even matter to the whole young Earth creation is quote unquote debate, right? There's not really debate, but whatever. Kent thinks there is. It doesn't make ma ma make a single bit of difference whether Kent Hoven can get this right or wrong. Him pretending that the inside of your cheek is skin does nothing to help him. It just makes him wrong for no reason, and I hate it. Because at least when he's wrong for a reason that makes sense, because if he were right, it would support his nonsense ideas, I get why he takes that stance, right? It makes sense to me. But when he says stuff like this, I'm like, no, he's just stupid. And I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. as Ancestral Clydesdale Megaphone also points out, 15 years of teaching science. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that Kent would say that you could get skin cells by like scraping the inside of his lungs or something? He might. Like if you did like one of those pulmonary lavage things, be like, oh, I coughed up a bunch of skin cells. They've got alveoli. Really? That's interesting. It's that's crazy. A weird thing for a skin cell to have. Uh, but also, Roasting a Transmissible Parasitic Dog Killer just gifted five Dapper Dinosaur memberships. Thank you so much. They went to James Duncan. Heather, do hyenas count as dat or cock? <laughs> Lance's Fossil Corner, David Taylor, Ian DeBunked, and Tesla Ranger. So here's five more drinks. Thank you. 
One, two, three, four, five, five drinks. <laughs> yeah, I, I did the count. <laughs> Put on a piece of glass, stick it under the microscope, add a little iodine, and it'll stain the cells, and you can actually study the different parts of the cell. A cell is sort of like... It just won't be skin cells, but yes, that is true. You can't do those things. <laughs> like a, I guess an egg is the best example, at least in an animal cell, because they have a, an outer membrane that is soft, and then all the stuff, there's thousands of... Oh, yeah, that reminds me, frog eggs. Like, basically any egg that you've ever seen is a single cell, like a chicken egg or an ostrich egg, but... Um, the, the calcium on like bird eggs, as well as the shell on like you know other reptile eggs like turtle eggs or lizard eggs, is secreted by the uh, mother and not by it's not grown by the cell itself. <clears throat> but if you look at fish eggs or uh, basically any invertebrate egg or amphibian eggs, those are cells too. Which I mean, I, mean, I think that's pretty cool. You know, if you've ever eaten fish roe, you've eaten individual cells. You ever get that 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 um. Oh, what's the what's the name for that sushi? Is it Tobiko? Oh, I don't remember. Well, the one with the little red fish row. Anyone who remembers what the name for that is in Japanese, let me know, because I'm drawing a blank on it. But yeah, if you've ever eaten that sushi, those little tiny little, little fish row, each one of those is a whole cell. Things inside the cell. Uh, one cell is more complicated than a city. Again, I don't know how you're measuring that. Creatures love to throw these things out. Right, but there's no there's no measurement for this, right? There's no like unit for complexity that just works across all systems. And the thing is, <clears throat> I don't necessarily dispute that that's a reasonable analogy to draw. That cells are like tiny little miniature cities with their own distribution systems and waste management and <clears throat> import and export and all this stuff, right? Because in a loose sense, yeah, that's true. But when you're going to try and make a point about how complex they are compared to other things. And then you're going to try to use that as some kind of argument about, against, you know, the unifying theory in all of biology. I'm going to ask to see your math. And how much math do you estimate that Kent has on this one, Vince? <laughs> Would it be no, the I'm... same amount of math as the number of molecules in a salt crystal? Pretty much. Yup. Uh... But inside the cell is another little membrane that holds the nucleus. Like, inside the egg is the yolk, the yellow part to the egg. I, I don't like that he's using a, a different cell with a different, nu a different organelle to describe how the nucleus works. Because, like, Kent, the, the yolk is also itself a membrane inside of a, of a different cell that also has a nucleus. The nucleus is... It, 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 you know, it's fine. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm also going to say thank you to... Rosina Keller, sorry, Rosina Transmissible Parasitic Dog, though, I can't leave all the Transmissible Parasitic Dog part, uh, has gifted 10 Dapper Dinosaur memberships. Nice. And they went to, uh, let me scroll up, here we go, uh, Zeisifer, Tsunami, Michael Schutz, Jillian Miracles from Molly, oh, nope, that's just a chat. Brent Hellman, Sam Stutler, Alex Wood, Mark Rose, Alien Bird, uh, Milwaukee Atheist, and Wayne Gaffney. Oh, hey, hey, Milwaukee Atheists. Um, you... You should have heard my uh, discussion with Landon Noel on Chesh's channel uh, yesterday, because we had a whole conversation about like how the canon of the Bible developed and different changes to out throughout history, like how did the Protestants get rid of the Apocrypha, um, how did the Old Testament canon get settled, hint it kind of didn't in most places, um, how the New Testament canon came about, how it had absolutely nothing to do with the Council of Nicaea at all in the least. That's not a thing. I mean, the Council of Nicaea is a thing. It just had nothing to do with the, you know, the biblical canon. Anyway, nice to see you. We'll take ten drinks. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is the last drink of this. Uh, right here. So we're actually going to take a slightly early break this time, so I can go refill my drink. There is ten. <clears throat> so, we are going to listen, well, you guys can listen, to the musical stylings of some weirdo called Benthoven, no relation, I don't know. It sounds so familiar. It does. Um, anyway, I think his music is pretty good. And uh, mm. then I'll go get myself a 
nice full glass of uh, vodka cola. And we will continue on. And so I will see you on the other side of the break. Please enjoy. Hey, we are back. Thank you for sticking with me, everybody. Actually, I think we grew in, in viewership while we were gone. That's unusual. Nice. Yeah. So uh, before we actually get right back into it, I do want to give my normal right after the break talk, which is to say, hey, guys, this channel is very much supported almost entirely through the generosity of the viewers. Um, I have been reminded heavily of that this past month because this past month, YouTube has just kind of decided that the algorithm just doesn't like this channel. Uh, it doesn't want to promote it. I don't know if you can tell, but this, uh, this show right now, we have about 12-ish percent fewer viewers than normal. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very annoying, and it's hard to uh, stay positive about it when that kind of thing happens. But one of the things that didn't happen was that it was a financial disaster last month, even though, according to the ad revenue, it probably should have been. And that's because of people like you who are watching. You guys are what keeps this channel afloat. You're the reason that this channel can keep pumping out videos, doing three shows a, uh, a week, um, and stuff like that. Like It's all because of you. And if you're currently someone who's not 
actively supporting financially, but you're interested in doing so, there's some great ways. One of the best ways is the Patreon. Patreon is the way area. That's the place where I get to keep the most money. Uh, it is. It starts at only a dollar a month. You can go all the way up to a hundred dollars a month. If you decide to go annually, you can get a fifteen percent discount. You get early access to something like it's actually now coming up on like seven months worth of content right now. Although, as I say that, I realize that at some point I'm going to start releasing like two videos a week for a little while. So it's not yes. actually going to be seven months, but it's seven months at the current pace is what I'll say. Um, or at least it's past six months. I guess this might not be out to a full seven. Whatever, it's fine. Um, you can get access to the Discord server. It's just for supporters. It's a pretty good deal, especially since it can start at just a buck a month. Um, <clears throat> the channel memberships are similar. They start at a uh, buck ninety nine a month. Uh, you can go all the way to twenty dollars a month if you want to. There is no annual discount, but it does also give you access to the emojis chat. It gives your name little green color it puts a little symbol after your name unless you're already a, a uh, moderator in which case it keeps your name as blue but you also still get the little symbol next to your name in addition to the branch or spanner um <clears throat> that's also a great way to support either way if you're at the five dollar or above you get your name in the credits at twenty dollars or above i'll read your name out during the credits i try to make it a pretty good deal uh, just today, if you're at the $10 or up on the Patreon level, I uh, gave you a blend file for Blender that will let you make a completely different <clears> star <throat> system for any given number that you pick. And then there's also tweakable parameters within that. So even though you and someone else might have picked the same number, you can still have a different solar system than that guy. So um, if that's yes. something that interests you, it's right there at the $10 level. Um, now, if a monthly or an annual thing isn't your deal, there's still a bunch of other ways. There is a merch store that's right below this video. There's a shelf full of merch. And if none of it uh, piques your interest, you can still click on any one of those items and be brought to the store and then search for other items because I can't, I've, I physically can't list everything on the store in there because YouTube won't let me. <laughs> they give me a limit as to how many things I can put on the shelf. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of stuff there. There's Blankets like that blanket that's behind bent. And I don't know if you can move a little bit to your, uh, your left. Uh, yeah, there's that blanket. There's a similar pillow. There's phone cases. I have a Dapper Dinosaur phone case right now. Um, so there's all sorts of great stuff. But if a f uh, there's also a wish list. I have a wish list. Bent has a wish list. Bent also has a Patreon mm -hmm. linked in the screen. Mm -hmm. um, but if none of that is your thing, if you can't afford to, or you just aren't interested in helping financially, that's fine. I don't, you don't owe me anything. But if you want to help out, and it, have it not cost you any additional money, please make sure you hit like. Share these videos. Just put them on your timeline or your feed or your wall or whatever we're calling it now. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say that we have a few super chats and some new members. So, <clears throat> Savage, <coughs> Sarcopterigi is extinct Cobra, gifted five memberships. They went to Quiet Fern, Luma, Thor Rasmussen, Arter Ams, Twitch, and Ancestral Clydesdale Megafauna. So we'll take five drinks for that. One. Two, three, four, and five. Thank you very much. Then Carrie Bronson gifted uh, for five, or sorry, ten dollars. I can talk. It says I thought the Castle of Nicaea was where they decide that psychic isn't magic, which eventually led to the creation of the coolest former Space Marines. Fight me. Uh, no, that's the Council of Nicaea with a K, not Nicaea. Yeah, yeah. big difference. Big difference. Anyway, Roasted a Transmissible Parasitic Dog Killer for $4.99 says, Names need to be green like Delicious Mountain Dew Baja Blast. Wait, isn't that blue? I thought it was regular Mountain Dew that was green and Baja Blast is blue. Am I, am I losing it? I don't remember. I thought Baja Blast was red, but I don't remember. No, that's code red. That makes more sense. <laughs> okay, hold on, chat. Please tell me, is Baja Blast blue and or, or am I just going insane? Because I, I am now very much not confident. Like, if you would ask me earlier, hey, what color is Baja Blast? I would have confidently said blue. Mm. Huh. Weird. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, all right, well, let's keep going with some Kent. Inside that nucleus are the DNA molecules. So mm, we're talking really, really tiny. DNA wasn't even discovered until... Uh, Probably the middle of this century. I actually am pretty sure that's not true, but it wasn't recognized as the molecule of inheritance. Because we've known about that DNA exists for a very long time. But that it was the molecule of inheritance has been less clear. So, 
Oh, yeah. And we are currently just on pace for another Tutu episode, guys. Nice. We could have another Tutu. You can see the old textbooks don't even mention it at all. I meant to get some of the 1940 textbooks I've got and 50 and 60 textbooks and compare and see when they begin talking about DNA. It'd be a good research project somebody could do. That would be a really weird and dumb research project because what benefit would there be to anyone in knowing like what the earliest textbook to use to talk about DNA was? I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. Uh, Voltage is blue, says Vandali1998. Okay, but what about Baja Blast? Minty Turquoise? Says Tiri. Okay. I mean, look, whenever I get Baja Blast, I usually just put it in the cup and then put the lid on and I don't think about it. So, I mean, I don't know. But uh, Francis Crick and somebody else, I forget his name, got a uh, Nobel Prize for discovering the DNA molecule. I think it was in the 1950s when they got that. So, they called it the double helix because it twists and then it twists again while it's twisted. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? Once again, what why is... are you wrong about this, Cat? I'm taking another drink. Jeez. No, it's called a double. First of all, the second twist that he's talking about isn't always helical. <clears throat> it's called a double helix because both sides of the, phosph the phosphate chain, the two sides of the ladder, if you will, both describe a helix. That's why it's a double helix. There's one phosphate chain and then the <laughs> opposite one. I, I, I am. I, I don't even know what to say anymore. How can how can one man <laughs> be this wrong about everything about DNA? I don't it's get it. Pretty funny. <laughs> Rosina transmissible parasitic dog killer for four nine says says Baja Blast is blue green, almost like the color of super ch of su super char. Oh, I think it means super chat, like super that super chat. chat. Okay, okay, that can that might explain why I feel like it was blue. Um, I mean, I haven't been paying a whole lot of attention. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say it's gru, which is a linguistics term for a color term in a, in a language that encompasses both green and blue. Uh, it's not a color term that you normally use in English, but I'm going to go with it. It's gru, and yes, it is in fact a portmanteau of blue and green, or well, green. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh, and Vesta Freya says, in 1869, a 25-year-old Swiss biochemist discovered a new substance in cells, calling it nucleon. It's a substance that is now known as DNA. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. I thought we were I was pretty sure that we'd been aware of the existence of it as a chemical for a very long time. We just didn't know what it was doing and why it was there. Um, all right. Those molecule, those DNA molecules are incredibly tiny. I mean, yeah, molecules are small, Ken. We've been over this. I, they're big for molecules. I, there's that, I guess. I... But the, if you unwound one of them, okay. it would be about six or seven feet long. I would have actually said that it was longer than that, but it would have been a guess. But sure, I'll... For the purposes of this, I'm just going to say sure. Fine. Six or seven sure, feet tall. Yeah. <laughs> 46 of these DNA molecules, and one DNA molecule is called a chromosome. Why? How do you... No! <laughs> each chromosome is a single molecule of DNA wound around various histone molecules, so each chromosome is in fact more than one molecule, but only one of them is DNA. It's the biggest one. And the other molecules, there's more than 46 of them. There's a lot more than 46. There's yeah. thousands and millions of them. And they're not... De I, take, I, I can't... How oh. can... Take another drink. Oh my god. How do you... Okay. It's we're gonna, we're gonna it's get just through absurd. this. This is high school stuff. This is like yeah. very basic. What a DNA, like what DNA is, what a chromosome is. You have 46 chromosomes, not 46 molecules of DNA in each of your chromosomes. That's what? <laughs> you have 46 squared t pieces of like DNA in your body? Is that the thing? Like, I, I, 
So, so you have 2,116 <laughs> molecules of DNA in each cell? Is that what we're going with? Because I just checked what 46 squared is. Nice. I can't. This is, I'm never going to recover from this. This is it, guys. This is my retirement party. This, that's it. I'm done. It's been fun. Yes. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, for us, a transmissible parasitic dog killer. I think Ken broke Dapper Dinosaur so much, he's going to go become a linguist. <laughs> oh, it would be less painful than whatever this is. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. This is way stupider than normal. It is pretty bad. Each, each chromosome contains millions of genes. Is it crashing on so me So the now? gene is like the rung of the ladder. The entire thing is called yeah, the chromosome. You have 46 of these in each cell in your body, except for the gametes. Now, a gamete is, called, is a sex cell. The egg and the... At first, it's a gamete, not a gamete, but sure, whatever. At this point, that's <laughs> extremely minor. Uh... I'm gonna find the video again and open it back up. I'm gonna turn bent off for a second just so you don't see me butting about. You'll still be audible. Like if you say something right now, everyone will hear you. Everyone. Oh no. Yeah. Not everyone. Mm hmm. All right. You can get skin cells off very easily. As trillion from the process when it divides, the molecule nucleus. Like inside the egg is the yolk, the yellow part to the egg. And we're close. Inside that nucleus are the DNA molecules. So we're talking really, really tiny. DNA wasn't even discovered until uh, probably the middle of this century. You can see the old textbooks don't even mention it at all. I meant to get some of the 1940 molecules called a chromosome. Each, con each chromosome again? contains millions of genes. Ooh. So the gene is, is my, like the is rung of the ladder. The entire thing is called the chromosome. Yeah, 46. I think the, the file might be corrupt. I don't know what to do in Ooh. that case. That's, Just that's not normal. Try again, but skip ahead. Yeah. A little bit. All right. I'm going to try to share it back with Ben, and we're going to see how this goes. If the file is corrupt, I have no idea what to do. That's Let's not talk about Star Trek. <laughs> we can we'll just talk. You know what? Fair enough. If the file is corrupt, we will talk about Star Trek. Um, I'm going to bring Bent back. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Savage Starcraft originally is extinct. Cobra for five dollars says your computer has exceeded its limit of psychic damage. Seriously, my computer might be like <laughs> rebelling against my conscious wishes to save my brain. Uh, tick fresh off the water or water. Sorry, tick fresh off the water. Talik. Says, uh, who's been a member for 23 months at the annual level, says, oh my god. Yeah. And they were gametes. Uh, okay, let's see what he has to say about gametes. So the gene is like the rung of the ladder. The entire thing is called the chromosome. I mean, if that's all you had said, then I would have accepted it, Kent. But no, you had to go into ridiculous weirdo land. You have 46 of these in each cell in your body. Except for the gametes. Now, a gamete is, called, is a sex cell. The egg and the sperm are called gametes. They each have 23, half of the genetic information. Kent, you said something correct about genetics? Oh my goodness, I'm taking a drink. Congratulations, man. And let's see if you can keep that up. He's not going to keep that up. No. <clears throat> and when a woman gets pregnant, the... Uh, half from the male and the half from the female join together and makes it back to 46. So a fertilized embryo, a fertilized egg, and now has 46 chromosomes. It got half from the mother and mm -hmm. half from the father. Also correct. Wow. We're, I mean, we're getting there. So during the process when it divides, uh, it's called a gamete. See, um, these chromosomes, about 40, 46 of them in every cell in a human. Average human has 50... There's actually a bunch of cells that don't have a nucleus at all, but whatever, it's fine. I'll just say every nucleated cell. It's, it's okay. A trillion cells in their body, which is a number that is just beyond comprehension. For those that don't remember... When I mean, I, it's, it's right there. It's 50 trillion. It's, it's the, that's the number. I don't know what's beyond comprehension about that. I mean, yeah, it's a big yeah. number, but is it incomprehensible? There are bigger numbers. Yeah, there's an infinite number of bigger numbers. <clears throat> there are as many bigger numbers as there are smaller numbers. 
When you count, a million is the number 1,000 with one more group of zeros. So it would be 1,000 plus three more zeros. A billion has two sets of zeros. So a total of nine zeros. It's 1,000 plus two sets of zeros. And a trillion has three sets of zeros. If you learn to count in Latin, you can count as high as you care to go. I'm going to go count to November Decillion. Good luck. I'm going to count by November Decillions, though. One November, okay. sorry, zero. One November Decillion. I did it. Good job. Yay. Billion for mono, billion for buy, like a bicycle has two wheels, trillion for tricycle, like three. I thought he was going to go for buy, like bisexual, because Kent has uh, an alleged and almost certain history of, uh, you know, doing a little hmm. bit of uh, uh, recreational activity, shall we say. Hmm. With uh, maybe some guys. You know, just putting that out there that that is uh, something I strongly suspect but cannot prove. Let's just say that. Three wheels. Quadrillion would be next. Like a Which, by the way, I don't particularly care, except that he's a virulent homophobe. Right? That's the, the only time I'm going to criticize you. Well, actually, there's two <clears throat> cases. One, if you're cheating, which he would be, because, you know, married to various women. Um, I'll criticize you there, but not for it being another man if you're a man. But I will criticize you for, you know, engaging in some same-sex behavior if you're a virulent homophobe. Yeah, that's when you get criticism from me for it. Normally, someone's like, oh, hey, I, my name's Joe. This is my boyfriend. It's like, okay, cool. Nice to meet you. Although I'd probably ask what his name is because calling you Joe's boyfriend would be weird. But anyway, uh, but if you're like, oh, no, I... the all queer people should be put to death, which is something Kent Hovind has said. And then seems like you're, uh, you know, missing, messing around a little bit. Yeah, now I am. I'm going to criticize. Uh, let's see. Heather, do I just count as that or cog coon for two dollars says, don't forget leukocytes with more than one nucleus. OK, fair enough. Yeah. Polynucleated cells are also a thing. Um, although I'm still going to say it's it's close enough to say that each cell has 46 chromosomes and I'm just going to leave it. Uh, Rosina transmissible parasitic dog out for 499 says Tango T is a, is a single cell organism. Audited, audited zygotes. I hate typing in super hats. <laughs> a bunch of hat emojis. Thank you. Thanks. And tick fresh off the water, Talik, for 200 Targentinian pesos says you have to thankful you have to thankful Aunt's dyslexia didn't read it as a gamete. Well, actually, you put gamete. Yeah, yeah, gamete. Yeah, I didn't read it as gamete. Yeah, that would be even worse. I didn't notice the slashes indicating that it was IPA. Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, gamete would be, would definitely be worse. I would. Yeah. A quad runner or something with four wheel drive, quad retraction for the Jeep. Then quintillion would be five sets of zeros plus the original thousand. And then sextillion, septillion, octillion, novillion, decillion. And who cares, right? Anyway. What about novem decillion, Kent? Come on. Duodecillion? Uh, Predecillion? Fine. I guess stop at Decillion. <laughs> like a loser. I went to Novemdecillion, man. Uh, so a trillion cells is an awfully lot of cells. When you figure the entire population of the planet is nowhere close to this number. True. <laughs> you know what? That's yeah. true, Kendall. Take a trip. I don't know what your point is. It sounds like this is a really extended big number, therefore God argument. It's probably going to be on the quiz next week. Better be taking notes. Man. You know, if Kent says a really big number, that just proves that God did whatever he says that God did. Yeah. That's just how it works. There are only about six billion people in the world. I believe at the time that this was filmed, that was roughly accurate. So we're going to accept it. This is 50,000 billion cells okay. in your body. Each one of those cells contains a little nucleus in the center, and the vast majority have 46 chromosomes. A few have 23, the gametes do. And some have more because they have more nuclei, and some have none because they don't have a nuclei, sure. If you took all the DNA out of one person, it would fill about two tablespoons. Teaspoons are the small ones, tablespoons are the big ones. It would fill two tablespoons with just pure DNA. If you took one chromosome from every individual on the planet, and this chromosome, each chromosome contains the blueprint, the instructions for how to build the entire person. 
Sure it does. I just slammed my head against the desk. Are you alright? No. No. That's that's not how anything <sighs> taking a drink. I don't blame you. Each chromosome does not have the entirety of the genome of an entire person. It takes Okay, there are twenty three types of chromosome. Now, except for the X and Y, each one is basically the same to whatever copy you're talking about, right? You have two chromosome twos, right? <clears throat> if you have we're we're gonna for now ignore chromosomal abnormalities like extra chromosomes, XXY, X0, stuff like that. We're just gonna go with stock standard typical human genetics, right? That is not to say that people who have chromosomal abnormalities aren't people. They don't matter, that they don't count. It's just that for the sake of simplicity, I am not going to talk about them right now. So, you have chromosomes 1 all the way to 22. And for each of those, you have two versions of them. Then, you generally either have two X's or two Y's. <clears throat> you X need and a Y? Yeah. Oh, sorry, two X's or an X and a Y. Sorry, I said two Y's, didn't I? Yeah, if you have two Y's, you die. Yeah. That's not an option. <laughs> You need an X chromosome or you will die. Which yeah. in and of itself should be an indication, right? Because Y is a different chromosome. If you don't have an X, you will die. I don't think Kent knows that, but if he did, he might realize how stupid this is. Because you need a full set of chromosomes to build a person. <clears throat> now, you could argue that a full set of 23 chromosomes, as long as one of them includes an X, would be enough to build an entire human if you doubled that up. Okay, sure. Fine. Whatever. But what you certainly can't do is... Take one chromosome, multiply it 45 times, and then grow a whole new human. That cell will die. It'll probably die before it gets to even divide once. <laughs> My goodness. Rosa Keller, uh, Rosa Keller, right? transmissible parasitic dog Keller for 49 says, drink because Kent got relative spoon sizes correct. AIG is a bag of Eric's. We'll take a drink. Sure. Man, I am now kind of disappointed that I'm not being more distracted by talk about Star Trek that I can drink for. <laughs> this is yeah. horrific. This is the worst. It's pretty bad. So if you had one chromosome from each person on the planet, theoretically, you could make every person again. No! Stop <laughs> doubling down on this. You have the information to make a new Becky, or a new Steve, or a new Eric, or whoever, okay, from one chromosome. All of that information, 5 billion or 6 billion chromosomes, would be about the size of an aspirin. I have no idea if that's true or not. I can't imagine how it matters. It doesn't matter. No. That's the information capable of making every human being again on the planet. Except that we have to multiply that by 46. But even then, I guess, I don't know, is 46 aspirins a small amount or a large amount? I don't even know. I don't even know what the point of this is. That's with our humans. current understanding. We may. No, Ken, that's not anyone's <laughs> understanding. <laughs> that's just some shit you made up one day. Uh, all right. Um, Pretty bad. Um, so I said something I wanted to read. Not updating. I'll scroll up here. <clears throat> I don't normally do this. Crypto457 says, uh, funny you say that, there's a branch of trans folks who actually believe that true men have YY chromosomes and YX is propaganda. Jeez. I hate this planet. I don't want to live on this planet <laughs> anymore. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's pretty funny. I mean, you know how the transphobes like to complain about its basic biology as if advanced biology didn't exist? Well, mm -hmm. at least get the basic biology right then, guys. Yeah. Like, jeez. Counter Italian for $2 says, Monty Python, get on with it, Kent, with a Godzilla, and we'll take a <laughs> drink. They discover later that even this is mostly space, and it could be condensed even smaller than that. It is mostly space. That's how <clears throat> molecules work. That's how atoms work. Good yeah, job, Kent. Yeah. You could condense DNA into a black hole, and yes, it would take up physically less space. What? You could do that with anything. What is the point? 
Oh my goodness. Just unbelievably complicated. Now, if you unwound each one of those chromosomes, okay. number 46 in each cell, each one is about six or seven feet long. Sure, why not? So you get six or seven feet times 46 mm -hmm. times 50 trillion. Why are we multiplying it by 50 trillion? That's how many cells in the body. What? So? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. One person's chromosomes would stretch from Earth to the moon and back. Round trips. Five million round trips to the moon. I don't even care. I'm not going to check that, but... <laughs> okay, sure, maybe. Therefore, creationism is true. Yeah, I guess. And keep in mind, that is like a twisted ladder. Uh, Goop do 3 and his deplorable ilk for $2 says, I've seen a basic biology transpo be anti-vax. Jeez. Yeah. Oof. Is that, is that better or worse than thinking that men are YY chromosomes? I think it might be worse because that's dangerous. It might be worse. Yeah, it's probably worse. Jeez, man, that's... That's so bad. Now, to make it even more interesting, if we had our ladder from here to Chicago, mm -hmm. and we twisted it and twisted it and twisted it, and as you, like, if you do a rubber band, you get it tighter and tighter, and pretty soon it starts to double knot. You know, it's, it starts to loop again. Again, it's actually looping around histones and whatnot, but sure, whatever, Kent. We'll just pretend it's too much torsion. Okay, similar idea. We're going to take this long ladder from here to Chicago and split it all the way down the middle. Each one of the rungs of the ladder is going to be cut in half. Okay, I, I mean, a weird way to describe it, but sure. <clears throat> Carrie Bronson for $5 says, If you stretch all a person's DNA out end to end, the person would die. This is correct. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It's just like if you had all the lawyers hold hands around the equator, uh, most of them would drown. All the way from here to Chicago. While it's twisted, it is going to unwind um, from the other half. This is not a thing that normally happens. Parts of the DNA separate during translation when, you know, RNA, well, you know, <clears throat> the <clears throat> chemicals that are going to make up RNA attach the DNA to build some RNA that's then going to transfer that information out of the nucleus and a different bit of RNA is going to attach to that and then that's going to send the message to the ribosomes. That happens and that un uh, quote unquote unzips part of the so called ladder. So we have two half ladders. N no, not a thing that ever happens. I'm, I'm taking a drink. This is, that's not a thing that no, ever happens. That's going to join up with the other half ladder from your husband or wife, wind itself back together from here to Chicago, <laughs> and make a child. Wow. wow. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm going to take a drink. Um, oh my goodness. I first can't of all, he taught this stuff that, for 15 that, years. First of all, that's not, that's not possible. Um, <laughs> okay. That's, are your yeah. parents identical twins of each other? No. Okay. But we're going to check in the chat. Chat, if your parents are identical twins, let me know. I'm going to go out on a limb and say no. Because I'm pretty sure that it's impossible for two identical twins to have a child together. Right? At least short of some really weird shenanigans. Um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. If you're not identical twins, then your DNA is going to be the same or different, Vince? Different. Different, right. So that means that the actual sequence of the nucleotides is going to be different on any given chromosome, at least in some places. Now... The way nucleotides work is that there's four nucleotide bases, and each one can only align with one other nucleotide base. Yep. Which means if you try to stick two strand, half strands of DNA together that weren't already identical, yeah. they wouldn't actually stick together all the way. Which means they couldn't actually function as a chromosome. What actually happens is that you get... <clears throat> so during meiosis you end up with four cells with half the normal number of chromosomes. And during this process, there's usually some crossover. 
between the different sets of chromosomes. So, um, <clears throat> like, let's say I'm undergoing, or I'm doing some meiosis in my body, which I presumably I'm doing, right? So in the spermatozoa that I'm producing, some of the chromosomes will be, like, part my dad's chromosome and part my mom's chromosome, right? And some of them will be a little bit more my dad than my mom and whatever. Fine. Great. That means that if you get if you have kids, they're not carrying, or most likely they're not carrying an entire chromosome that's identical to one of your like father, their grandfather's chromosomes, right? Because there's crossover events. But then once those two chromosomes from the ovum and the spermatozoan merge together, that that's the chromosome set. Right? There's no unwinding of the DNA. It doesn't come back together with half and half. I just oh my goodness. Stephen J. Kennard, who's been a member for one month, is at the Tetrabob level, says, Senator Vrenak says, it's a fake! Yes, he does say it's, it's a, fake. a fake. But then he gets blow the F up before he can report back to Romulus that it's a fake, and all they get is their little forensic analysis that says that it was a Dominion bomb that blew up the shuttle, and they can't tell that the damaged data disc or data stick is uh, a fake anymore. So they join on the side of the Federation, and we'll also we're taking a drink for this. That was me talking about Star Trek. I said super chats, but yeah, whatever. I'll take it as a membership chat. Sorry. Oh my goodness! Oh. Drink from Mothra. Mothra came by, everybody. Thank you very much, Mothra. All right. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, and then the wrong ones join, and you know what? <clears throat> Maybe it's unethical, but that helped save the the Alpha Quadrant. And what did it cost? The life of one Romulan senator and the self-respect of one Starfleet captain. I'd call that a pretty good deal. Thanks, Garrick. Each half of the rung is a genetic trait. <laughs> no, no, it's a nucleotide. Oh my goodness, Ken. This is known. Like... Does he just think nobody knows any better? I, I don't I don't know how his audience isn't calling him on this. I mean I, They might not know better. This was supposedly accepted for college credit. This. Uh, also, Stephen G. Clinard for two dollars says, I can live with that. Which is in fact that famous line from Cisco towards the end where he's holding up that little tumbler of some liquor, presumably. He's like, I can live with that, and he downs the rest of it. Such an amazing scene. Avery Brooks was amazing in that episode. I mean, honestly, Avery Brooks is usually amazing in most of his episodes, but that one mm. was just off the charts. I, yeah. <clears throat> Roasting a transmissible parasitic dog killer set for one night and says the ends justify the means in Star Trek. So we're going to take a drink because I'm talking about Star Trek again. And the thing is, um, I would say that ultimately it's, that's just usually how people act in real life. Um, you do get some principal people here and there, but I think that uh, <clears throat> at least on the international stage, which is what we're talking about, we're doing, we're talking about in the pale moonlight. Um, real politic is the name of the game, and as much as that sucks, as much as it is at best morally gray, and often just and you know immoral. Um, it, yeah, I I think that was a look at what happens when um, you know the good people are presented with a situation in which there is no good outcome by acting in a moral fashion. And Star Trek really hadn't talked about that kind of thing much. And um, I think it was interesting that they went there with Deep Space Nine and still kept the moral core of all those characters, right? Like, that didn't turn Benjamin Sisko into an anti-hero or anything. But he realized that, you know what? Maybe this time I do have to compromise. And that happens to people, and it sucks. You gotta figure out what you're gonna do. Are you gonna compromise your principles? Are you gonna not? I don't know. Um, yeah, I know I've compromised principles before, and I'm not always happy about it. So, Stephen G. Clinard um, sent a super chat that's been re uh, retracted. Thank you very much, Stephen. A savage Sarcopterigi is extinct. Cobra sent a two dollars super chat and said, "Computer, erase that entire personal log." Yes, you guys, in the pale moonlight. I'm gonna have to go watch in the pale moonlight after this at some point. <laughs> Um, maybe when I'm working on the uh, this month's credit scene, which is, by the way, it's not done. And then Strawberry paraphrased Academically Vain with what is allegedly, yet again, another fifth super chat ever. 
from Strawberry Vein. <laughs> Even though that's what it says for every one of Strawberry Vein Super Chats. It says for $2, this is definitely, totally my <laughs> Super Chat. <laughs> And then for five dollars, Zimor fifty two says, "I didn't know about any of this before two thousand eight, and probably not before twenty twelve at most. Like the genetic stuff or the Star Trek stuff, because the Star Trek stuff that's probably okay, but the genetic stuff, I sounds like you just had a bad school. Um, so yeah, so did I. Yeah, that's true. Did you have a, a young Earth creation of school? Didn't you? Yes, I did." Hey, we're uh, 95 away from a tutu. We could do it. Nice. It's possible. 95. Maybe the dad supplies the half of the wrong for blonde hair, and the wife supplies the half of the wrong for brown hair. Again, no, Kent. Hair, hair color is mostly genetically determined, but a gene isn't a single nucleotide. <laughs> I, oh my goodness. And besides... Different versions of the same gene aren't separate genes. They're different alleles of the same gene. If you have the brown hair allele, and we're just pretending that hair color is just determined by a single gene, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but who cares? If you just have the brown allele and the blonde allele, they're going to be on separate chromosomes, and they're going to take up entire strings of nucleotides. All sections. DM and his deplorable ilk wing for... Oh, sorry. DM wing and his deplorable ilk. I'm so used to DM wing splitting up the DM and the wing. But that's what's throwing me, right? Because right now it's DM wing and his deplorable ilk. Anyway. For $5 says, And there was that time he committed a war crime because he got annoyed by someone betraying their uniform. Look. <clears throat> uh, that I'm less okay with when it comes to Cisco. Uh, and that's in part because I am absolutely a Maki sympathizer. So we're going to take another drink for that. And I know Bent likes to disagree with me, and that's fine. I've come around a little bit, but... Okay. But yeah, the, the Maquis... See, here's the thing about the Maquis, right? They settled uninhabited planets throughout... Sure, it was in the Cardassian border area, but so what? <clears throat> they were doing everything by the... Up and up. Right? They're Federation citizens. Then suddenly, the Federation gets into some stupid spat with the Cardassian Union. And then, without their consent, suddenly, now they're a part of the Cardassian Union. Whatever happened to things like consent of the governed? At the very least, you could have set up a demilitarized neutral zone and said that those people living there weren't part of the Federation or the Cardassian Union. No, we're just going to cede these planets to the Cardassian Union. I think they had every right to attack Cardassian military targets and Federation military targets that try to suppress them and stop them from attacking the Cardassians. They were absolutely done dirty, and they had every right to do that. Now, not every single one of their tactics was on the up and up. But then again, neither was every one of the Federations or the Cardassian Unions. So it's not like there's a whole bunch of good guys in that scenario. But the ones who aren't the bad guys in that scenario, between the Cardassian Union, the Federation, and the Maquis, are the Maquis. I'm not going to call them the good guys. But they're definitely not the bad guys between that, those three groups. Um, <clears throat> Carrie Bronson for $5 says, What compromising principles in the face of an impossible situation and having to live with it? And well, which one's the baby going to have? Well, that gets into which one of these genes is more dominant. There are and dominant and recessive genes. Sure. The baby might end up with blonde hair, but capable of producing a brown-haired child. Because even though what expressed itself in that generation... No, no. Brown hair is dominant over blonde hair. Right? So... Come on, Ken. <laughs> Does he think it's random? Which one ends up being dominant every no, time? He might. So the deal is, right? <laughs> what primarily is determining your hair color is the concentration <clears throat> of melanin. The difference between being brown haired and being blonde haired is primarily how much melanin are in your hair is in your hair cells. So they're your hair follicles, the cells that are growing out and dying to become your hair. Okay. If you have an allele that says produce a lot of melanin, and then you have a different allele that says eh, don't produce a whole bunch of melanin, guess what? The expression of the melanin gene is going to be right, or well, the expression of producing the melanin in that gene is going to be right there. So that's what's going to happen, right? When you have a competition between, hey, make this product on one allele, and another allele that says, don't make that product so much, you express that, make that much product, right? Because they're both, there you go. If you get a double signal of make this product, you just make the product. It takes two copies of the don't make a product for that to happen. 
That's why, as a general rule, if two alleles, one, one says just make more of the thing, and the other one says make less of the thing, make more of the thing wins. General rule of thumb for recessive and dominant traits. Uh, off Journey for $5 says, three times shared and five times light. Late is better than not at all. Am I right? Nice. And, or sorry, sorry. And yes, you are right. That is correct. All right. Here we go. Generation was blonde hair. They are carrying the gene, the half rung of the ladder, for yeah. brown hair. So then the grandkids come out with brown hair, or depending on who they marry. And that's a very interesting study. You get into that in biology class, studying all the, you know, what can happen when you cross different genes together. But the genetic structure is incredibly complicated. They say that the code in the chromosomes is more complex and holds more information than all the computer programs ever written in the history of humanity. Well, that's flatly wrong. I mean, who says that? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> there's four nucleotides, right? So you can encode that in quaternary. And quaternary breaks down to two bits per digit, right? So you have a two-bit code. Every nucleotide is two bits, right? So <clears throat> um, let's check the genome size of Homo sapiens. Which, uh, yeah, there we go. So let's see. <clears throat> oh, wait, I forgot to put in the words. Uh, 3.1 billion base pairs. Okay, so let's do some quick math. We take 3.1, uh, let's see, billion times 4, and you get to, this takes, let's see, 124 billion bits. Right. So let's see. We'll divide that by 8. So... That gives us... Did I screw something up? Alright, so we'll divide that by 8 to get bytes. Yeah, so 15 billion 500 million bytes. I downloaded... I, I download for every single one of my videos more than that. Every single time I make an animated video. I have a hard drive here that currently holds like that currently just stored on it has like three and a half terabytes. This is this is absurdly wrong. There's this is off by so many orders of magnitude. It's hard to even express how wrong this is. <laughs> you can fit the entirety of the human genome in like, on like a modestly sized bookshelf in just normal size font in. Roasting on a transmissible parasitic dog killer for four ninety nine says at least he's not talking about blue eyes. At least fifteen genes can uh, contribute to that. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm willing to to simplify a gene down to like a single trait for a single gene to talk about patterns of inheritance in a simplified way. That's fine by me. But yeah, it is way more complicated. <coughs> um. So yeah, I. It is. It is actually honestly like nearly incomprehensible the degree to which Kent is wrong right now. Uh, yeah. Oh, hey. We're less than 75 away from a 2-2. Nice. Combined. I'm excited. Also, a two, new 2-2 would be another another fancy avatar. We could even get oh, the nice. return of Clay Dapper. Ooh. Everyone likes Clay Dapper. And I would probably put in a little bit more tooth. I thought that the tooth, uh, the teeth disappeared too much last time, so I would, I would lower mm -hmm. the set point on that for when the teeth come in. Incredibly complicated. Bill Gates. Founder of Microsoft. He you know what? Sure, we'll take a drink. Bill Gates is indeed the founder of Microsoft. <laughs> I'm getting generous. He said, DNA is like a software program, but it's much more complex than anything we've been able to design. Cool. Bill Gates isn't a geneticist. I have no, I, I have very, very low confidence that he understands how any of this works, but okay. Now, when Tapper needs braces, Oh, but wait, if I accept this beer, then it means no dental plan. When they design a software program, how frequently do they encounter a glitch or a problem? Do any of you work with computers at all? You ever seen I've never encountered a glitch ever. That's, you know, several times today. You know, a computer have a glitch where the program doesn't work. All the time, right? Yep. Now, suppose I told you to take your computer program, we're going to load uh, Windows uh, Millennium Edition, or Windows 98, or Windows 95, okay? 
Okay, sure. Date this video immediately. Okay, any one of those programs. I want you to take that program with all that list of instructions and copy it onto a disk. Okay. Now I want you to take... You mean like a Windows install disk? Is that... <clears throat> okay, sure. Take your Windows install disk. That copy and copy that onto another disk. Okay. So now you've made a second Windows install disk. Then take that disk and copy it onto another disk. The more times you copy it, the more likely you are to have mistakes come in. It's extremely unlikely. Like, it's not impossible, but it's very, very unlikely. File copying right now is extremely, extremely reliable. It's very low error rates. Like, <coughs> it's almost to the point where I, it's, it's not that unreasonable to say that it's actually lossless. Not technically yeah. lossless. You can find, there can be mistakes. It's extremely unlikely, but sure, whatever. Problems come in. You ever seen a photocopy of a piece of, piece of paper where somebody copied an article? Photocopying is inherently loss, lossy, Kent. Much more so than file copying. Does Kent just not know how file copying works, that there's error checking? Not. and No. Okay, I'm just going to take it. He's no idea. Jeez. Okay, you... So for reference, computer file copying is way less lossy than DNA replication. And photocopying has way more loss than DNA replication. And he's going for, like, extreme ends of the spectrum, right? Like, DNA is between these two. Photocopying is extremely, extremely full of loss, right? It ups that contrast and sharpens the hell out of anything. File copying is essentially lossless, right? In, you could copy files for thousands of years and just never find any, any mistake. DNA, on the other hand, is somewhere in the middle. I'm going to put the Super Chats here. Stephen J. Clinard says, he kind of lost me with Microsoft Windows. Eh, fair. Rosano Transmissible Parasitic Dog Killer. Or 499 says, Kent is copying with iOmega zip disks. He's used to data loss via click of death. <laughs> uh, you know what? That might actually be in like the zip disk era. When was the zip disk era? It was short, but I remember it. Yeah, One I those think it was big... around that okay. time. Okay. Maybe a little earlier. Yeah, I remember those. And then, like, I remember very quickly the world shifted to, like, writable CDs. And then right after that, it was, like, USB drives and, mm -hmm. and like, the cloud. Which, by the way, there's no such thing as the cloud. It's just someone else's computer, in case you're wondering. And somebody else said, wow, this is good. I'm going to make a copy of this. So they copy the copy. Do you think Kent realizes that Chapter 1 of Doom was copied thousands of times in a row to get to everyone's computer because at one point Doom had more installs than Windows back in the <laughs> mid-90s and that yes. no one encountered extra glitches as a result of using someone's copy of a 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 copy because it was literally shareware. Its software mm -hmm. was like, here are free discs that have chapter one of Doom. Do with them what you will. Make as many copies as you want. Give them to everyone. But if you want chapter mm -hmm. two, you got to give us money. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I'm pretty decent at Chapter 1 and absolute trash at Chapter <laughs> 2. Because <laughs> I don't know the levels in Chapter 2. Because as a kid, I didn't have Chapter 2. In fact, I didn't even have Chapter 1 on my computer. I had to go to a friend's house to play Doom because my dad would not have let Doom on my computer. Not in this Christian household. Mm. Then this person says, wow, that's really good. I'm going to copy that. So they copy the copy of the copy. After about eight or ten copies, you can't hardly read it. Um, you ever gotten something like that? Oh, yeah, he's talking about the photocopy. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah. kind of true. Yeah. You just say, wow, it's all blurred, and you know, everything starts to run. No, it's not going to be blurred, Kent. It's a photocopy. It's going to be sharpened <laughs> to shit. And because of all the increases in contrast, any little bits of dust are going to start showing up, but it's not going to be blurred. It's going to be the opposite of blurred. It's going to be sharpened. The software in there actively sharpens the image. It increases the contrast and then uses edge detection to sharpen the edges. <clears throat> it is the opposite of blurred, Kent. I just... <laughs> How do you mix up sharpen and blur? I'm taking, I, I can't. I'm going to have to get, like, a third drink after this just to cool down after. Yeah. My sorry. goodness, this is... There's this might there. be the worst. This I know I've said this before, but this might actually still be the worst Kent performance that we've ever seen. As far as like number of things he said that are wrong, there's a lot. It's so episode. constant, and it's such it's basic so crap. 
together. We are a copy, off of a copy, off of a copy, off 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 a copy of Adam. Do you realize how many times this gene code has been duplicated? Let's see. Let's say Kent is right. And uh, so let's see. There have been about 6,000 years. We'll give the average generation time of about 25. Um, so let's see. About 240 times per person on average. Yeah, 240. I mean, for a file, that would be fine. For a photocopy, that'd be pretty bad. Yeah. Um, for DNA? I don't know. It's okay. And still working pretty good. Yeah. Well, the parts that don't work pretty good tend to get weeded out by this little thing called natural selection, which is, you know, a thing. Yeah. Even according to Kent, it's a thing. The original must have been awesome <laughs> um, to have this number of generations of copies still working at all. Kent, okay, we'll, we'll do an analogy with the computer files, because there are losses in computer file copying, right? But let's say every time there was a, a loss that made the program run less well, that disk never then got copied. You could go more or less indefinitely that way. And that's what natural selection is, right? It's like, oh, you have a mutation, and it's making you not able to reproduce, or at least not reproduce very well. That doesn't tend to get passed down and persist. Uh, Roasting a transmissible parasitic dog color for 49N says, dry firmware triggers me, and, <laughs> and today I learned photocopiers trigger diaper dinosaur. No, it's not photocopiers. I'm fine with photocopiers. I'm not fine with someone saying that photocopiers blur things, which is literally the opposite of what they do. It's the actual opposite. Savage, Sarcopterucci is extinct cobra for $2 says, but can human DNA run crisis? You know what? No, but it might be able to run Doom, because anything can run Doom. <laughs> um, I technically saw do run on a whole bunch of potatoes. I mean, granted, they were actually potatoes being used as a battery bank to power a Raspberry Pi, which was actually a thing running Doom. But still, this dude had a garage full of rotting potatoes, and he <laughs> plugged wires into them, and he powered up his Raspberry Pi. He played Doom on it. By God. Nice. Um. So yeah, that's a that is a thing I have seen. Uh, I think it's on you. Yeah, it's definitely on YouTube. You can find it if you look. Like, in something like can a potato play doom or something like that so to say dna is small and therefore it must be simple is absolutely ridiculous okay. yes but who has ever said that <laughs> i want to know who has said that what what are no you talking about yeah i've never met anyone who said well dna is so small it must be simple strawberry <laughs> paraphrase academically vain for five dollars says genes aren't literal computer files for Say yeah, no, absolutely correct. This is this is uh, this is actually driving me crazy. This is insane. Okay, it is unbelievably complicated. If you typed out the code, now here's what happens: a DNA has a DNA. Okay, four base <laughs> pairs. Well, it has four kinds of base pair, but sure, yeah. What they've done is they've taken each of these genes. You said it right the first time. They're base pairs. They're base not pairs aren't genes. genes. Jeez, I'm I, I can't. I don't know how else to say it. And they could get a whole cluster of molecules and call it a base pair. Like, they give it a letter A. So they will say, well, DNA is very simple. There are only four base pairs. I mean, I, those two things are not necessarily true, right? I could say, well, computer code is very simple. It only has zeros and ones. Yeah, that's yeah, technically that's true, but I don't think that that therefore means that all computer codes are simple because they're only made of zeros and ones. It's it's the arrangement of them that matters. That's the important yeah. thing, right? It's their sequence that's important. I, you could say English is a very simple language. It only has 26 letters. I mean, come on. You only need to know 26 letters, and then you speak English. Yeah, tell that to anyone who's trying to learn English as a second language. I'll probably slap you in the face. Well, hold it. That's like me saying, you know, vehicles on the highway are very simple. There's only four basic kinds. You know, there's trucks, there's cars, there's motorcycles, and there's buses. Um, no, because there's different models and makes of each of those things. If you... It... <laughs> okay.
Okay, let's say you have let, let's say you have cytosine, right? That's one of the, the base nucleotides. Every cytosine is identical to every other one. It's a set of particular molecules in a particular order, in a particular shape. And if it changes, it's no longer the same base pair. It's now just nothing. Not a base pair same. anymore. There's no internal variety between the base pairs. I... Well, just because I can put them into four simple categories doesn't mean each one is simple. I mean, I... you know what? Let's check. Let's check. How many, how many atoms are there in, say... Let's see. Uh... What's your favorite nucleotide, Bent? Adenosine. All right. Check adenosine. Or is it adenine? No, I don't remember. Yeah, it's adenine. Okay, so adenine has, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 atoms in adenine. I don't know. I call that pretty simple. 13 atoms is pretty, it's a pretty low number of atoms. What do you guys think? I don't know. It seems pretty simple to me. I mean, at least as molecules go, there are way bigger molecules mm -hmm. out there than, yeah. than 13 atoms, most of them being carbon. All right, for $2, Liz D says, AIG is a bag of small, simple cantaloupe. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a drink. Nice. Time. My goodness. Uh, wow. Each one of those categories is very complex. You know, how many, how many things are there on a car? A lot more than 13, Kent. A <laughs> lot more than 13. Like, normally, I'm like, I don't know how to assess this complexity thing. But when it comes to 13 atoms versus an entire-ass car, I'm going to pick the car as being more complex every single time. Strawberry Vane, <laughs> with yet another fifth super chat, <laughs> for $2, says, drink for creationist car analogy. That's fair. I'll, I'll drink for that. Let's use the wine emoji. No one uses the wine emoji. I appreciate that. I like wine. I haven't had wine in a while. Like, <clears> check. I can't even remember the last time. Didn't you have some, like, NA wine on Thanksgiving? NA wine, yeah. Oh, I guess I had some but champagne for... Actual wine? That counts, right? Champagne is wine. I'll count it. I'll allow it. NA wine counts. It's wine. It just had the alcohol removed. It's not the same. It's not the same, but it's still wine. It's like saying Chardonnay isn't the same as Merlot. Yeah, but they're still both wine. Yeah, that's fair. Remember, Eric, the first car you had, you know, 13 years old, we rebuilt that old Datsun. Hey, the same number of years old as there are in adenine. Or, well, Adam's in adenine. Yeah, nice. Is, yeah. Or, uh, no, whatever it was, Datsun 510. A car is complicated. I don't think we're going to do it. We're still 52 away. I don't think we're going to get it. Shucks. You're released from the tutu, probably. Probably. We'll see. There's still How many things would have to be wrong to make a car quit working? It depends. There's no one number. At a minimum, one, I guess. Depends how you count them. I don't know. It depends on what's wrong. Yeah. Any one of thousands of things. I don't know how you're counting, but sure, whatever. I don't care. When my dad was in the Marines, he said uh, during World War II, one of their jobs was to go into the islands after they took over from the Japanese, set up radar, the early days of radar. My dad was involved in that. And they had a diesel engine. The engine ran a generator to power, to give them electricity, to run the radar station. So they had to be really good mechanics. If anything goes wrong, you've got to fix it. As part of their training, they would have somebody come in there after they learned all about the engine, how it runs. Yeah, we have heard this story before. They would sabotage it to make it not run, and you had to see how long it took you to figure out the problem. Can you imagine all the neat things you could do to cause an engine to not run, to give somebody a hard time? Yes, I can, Kent. I absolutely can. I don't, I don't know how this is supposed to be relevant. You take the distributor cap off, take a pen. My Unfinished Life for $5 says, celebrating the fifth uh, SC for, oh yeah, Super Chat, uh, from at Strawberry, paraphrase Act of Vein, with a cool face emoji and a champagne emoji, pelagic tuna kit. Thank you very much. And for $2, or sorry, $1.99. I'm going to go with Jada on the as Kent's analogy is garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> now there's a good computing analogy right there. I like that one. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. Pencil, whoosh, draw a few lines around there, put it back on. Graphite conducts electricity. 
through. Not greatly, but yeah, it does. So as soon as it tries to spark to one spark plug, the spark goes to all spark plugs. Hooray, you shorted out your spark plugs. Now they're not firing in the correct sequence, okay? It follows the graphite around the inside. Very simple. <laughs> Car won't run. Okay, how is that going to be a real fault that happens, though? Like, are there people out there, like, just maliciously putting graphite dust across, like, your electrical system in your car to short out all your spark plugs? Like, who knows? Maybe. I, look, here's the thing, right? I've known people who've done things like this, like, done really weird faults that would never actually happen as an attempt to just test it. It's a huge dick move. The last guy I did that to, or sorry, the last guy that did that in my presence, um... Yeah, I made it aware. I made everyone aware that he he was basically sabotaging equipment as some kind of teaching thing, and he was the new guy. Yeah, that didn't last all that long. It did not go over well. Every, <coughs> you know what? In the words of Fallout New Vegas, everyone hated that. It's a really big dick move. Um, roasting a transmissible parasitic dog collar for one ninety nine says simple machines are best machines, Kent, and then fits of. Z- Bits of Zircon forms when the granite cools rage. Or gifted one membership and it went to Aunt Jerry. We'll take a drink for that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's called fuzzing. Yeah, I look. I'm not currently in a job where I'm doing stuff like installing new electrical equipment or something. But um if I find out that you're doing that, at the very least, I'm never gonna trust you with anything ever again. Ever. And I'm yeah. It's, you're just a drag on everyone. Just don't. He said the hardest one for him to find was when the, the sergeant came in there and he took the spark plug wires, which are going out. He took a needle, poked it through two wires, clipped the needle off, roughed up the rubber so you couldn't tell it was there. But the spark was being conducted from those two each time. It was supposed to go to this spark plug. It went to both of them. Engine wouldn't run. He said that was the hardest one to find. Just a simple thing to sabotage it. When you think how the more complex something becomes, the easier it is for something to break down. Are you saying that unnecessary complexity is a really bad design choice, Kent? Because if that's what he's going with, I'm going to have to go ahead and say that um, that's not great for the whole uh, God did it argument. Uh, but also, I have to say thank you very much to Strawberry Vein, who, oh, sorry, re, sorry, Strawberry Paraphrase Academically Vein. We get to five Dapper Dinosaur memberships. They went to Dither, John D., nice. Alessandra Hedgeblog. Mabbity Babbity and Derek Henrik. We will take five drinks for that. So let's see. One, two, three, four, and five. Which actually only puts us $13 away. We could do it. That's close. But we are also wrapping up right now. So. If $13 comes in during the wrap-up session, then, uh, yeah, we do, in fact, have you in a tutu next week and a Dapper Dinosaur uh, special avatar coming up. So, um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> Bench, do you want to tell anyone about anything that you got coming up? Um, I don't think I have anything coming up. Okay. Well, Bent has a Patreon link in the description. Feel free to go check that out. Um... It also has a wish list down in the description. I don't know. What's on there? What do you got on there? Anything good? Food. Lots of food. I'm Lots so hungry. Okay. Bent is a, is a hungry primate. Feed Bent. Yeah. Feed me, please. Thank you. All right. Um, I, too, have a Patreon and a wish list down in the description. Feel free to check those out if you would like. Um, it would be appreciated. But then there's yeah. Rosen and Keller with, to, with, for $19.99 saying, do it. Yes. And Renee with five gifted memberships. My <laughs> goodness. Thank you so much. That actually, that might be close to you getting a free pizza. I'm not sure. And then there's another twenty dollars from Strawberry Vein for two two. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. People, people like the two two. Um. So yeah. Um. Thank you very much. So um, I, what's coming up here on this channel is um. Oh, it's not. We're uh twenty three away from a uh, Ben gets pizza. No. Sorry, Ben. That's all right. All right. So what's coming up on this channel is on Thursday, we are having the uh, the premiere of the incoherent, or sorry, David Gottlieb incoherent shouty moron, the movie. It is, I think it's about two and a half-ish hours. I'm not sure. Um, so 
you know, bring a snack, bring a drink. Um, that'll be at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Then on Saturday, at the same time, uh, Vishanti will be back from her, uh, her, her bereavement trip. So our, our feelings go out to Vishanti. Our condolences. Um, yeah, she is currently in the air on her way to uh, visit family for a funeral. So, you know, uh, if, if you encounter Vishanti online, maybe wish her well. Um, Rosina Transmissile Parasitic Dog Killer for one ninety nine says, Tutu is manly. There you go. But is it Scott manly? Thank you. Um, Probably not. Probably not. Unless well, he's safe. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So that will that the plan is to do another uh for reacts focusing on Dino Dave, Dave Wurzel, whatnot. Um so that is the plan for that. And then on the next Tuesday, we'll be back with Kent with Bent number 135 with a different uh Jeffrey Combs picture photoshopped into Kent Hovind's face. Um <clears throat> and I don't know what the title is gonna be yet. So there's that. I'll, maybe I'll pick a uh episode that has a brunt in it. So you know what? Send in your, like, DM me your favorite Brunt, uh, you know, Inspector Brunt of the FCA uh, episode titles. And I'll, I'll try to pick the one that I like the most. So mm -hmm. there you go. Um, but that basically wraps it up here for what's coming up next week. If you are interested, over on the Dapper Dinosaur uh, supporter Discord for patrons and channel members, we're going to be watching uh, four episodes of Power Rangers Dino Thunder. And also on Wednesday, uh, on my Top Hats Off channel, we are going to be playing Power Rangers the role-playing game with uh, Maddie, and there's, there's a bunch of people that you'll recognize there. There's some people you won't recognize, uh, and it's a fun time. So feel free to stop by. That will be at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. It'll probably go about two hours. So there you go. So stay safe, everyone out there. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I hope to see all of you on Thursday, and we are getting out of here. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Toven, Felgevaga, Tapioca Weasel, Whispers, E to V, Strawberry Vane, Danny 5252, Aleron Teller, Horse Flesh, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, Monkey Day Them, Sphincter of Doom, and Volus. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.